Here's a very beautiful calculus exercise that I saw in Spivak's calculus book, and I'm so excited to share it with you. It basically asks the following, that if n at least one is a positive integer, so n could be one, two, three, four, etc. doesn't matter, you fix an n, and you have a continuous function from 0, 1 to r, the closed interval 0, 1 to the real numbers, such that f of 0 is equal to f of 1. There is always an x between 0 and 1, so that f of x plus 1 over n is equal to f of x. So the two values of f match and are 1 over n apart in the x inputs. So for example, you could have the graph of this function here. You can see that its value at 0 and its value at 1 are the same. Let's say we take a value of n. So we could take, for example, n is equal to 3. So then we're looking at one third as the difference and we could imagine two points. So I'm just going to sort of label them here. We could have this point and this point and they could be one third apart. This could be x, this could be x plus one third and the two values of f match up, okay? They lie on the same horizontal line parallel to the x axis. Now, how do we rigorously prove this, okay? And one thing that's really cool is to ask if this question is true if one over n is replaced by another number that's not of the form one over n. We get to that, okay? But let's first answer this problem. So here's the proof, okay? We're just gonna dive into the proof. And essentially the thing I want you to think about whenever you think about problems with continuous functions, so this is the core concept, and you think about showing that an equation has a solution without necessarily knowing where the solution is, you always wanna think of the IVT, the intermediate value theorem, that basically you wanna look at that and the way you want to look at that is the IVT, which we'll recall, is the following. It basically says that if you have a continuous function and it is positive somewhere and it is negative somewhere, then it has to be zero in between. Okay, that's the rough description. I'll go through it rigorously in this video, but in this case, we will look at the equality f of x plus one over n equals f of x. We want to apply the IVT. So we consider the function g of x is equal to the following, f of x plus one over n minus f of x. Okay, so we now want to show that this g of x is zero somewhere. Okay, so we've reduced the problem to showing this is zero. So we're interested now in the sign of g of x. When is it positive? When is it negative? If we can show it is somewhere positive and somewhere negative, on the interval 0, 1, because it's a continuous function on 0, 1, we can apply the intermediate value theorem to say that somewhere it's going to cut the x-axis. You know, you can literally imagine, I don't know what g is, but if somewhere it's positive, somewhere it's negative, it's continuous, you know, you can draw the graph with a single stroke of a pen, that's the intuition. There's no way that that can happen unless it's cutting 0 somewhere, cutting the x-axis somewhere. Okay, so how do we actually understand the sign of g of x? So let's think about it as follows. Let's look at g of 0. Okay, so I'm just going to look at it step by step. G of zero is going to equal to f of one over n minus f of zero. Okay, so that's cool. Now, we don't know what this is, okay? We don't have any idea, but let's keep going. Let's look at g of one over n. Okay, so g of one over n is one over n plus one over n is two, of it, two over n. So it's f of two over n minus f of one over n. Okay, so these are successive differences of f. Now, what's interesting is we know that these all have to have the same sign, right? Because if one of them was negative and one of them was positive, we'd have a zero somewhere for our g. So let's keep going with this. We can keep on going and we can finally say g of n minus one over n is going to equal to f of one minus f of n minus one over n. Okay, so we've got all these successive differences of f and I can draw it up top right now. We're gonna do the following trick. So we've got all these successive differences of f. Now what we can do is we can write f of one minus f of zero which we know is equal to zero, right? We know that f of one and f of zero is the same. So what's interesting is that the successive differences of f, we can write it as f of one minus f of n minus one over n. Then we could do plus f of n minus one over n minus f of n minus two over n. And you get the idea, okay? So on and so forth, okay? So so on and so forth, all the way up to f of two over n minus f of one over n. And then we can finally get plus f of one over n minus f of zero, okay? And what's really cool about this is you see, this is what is called a telescoping sum. So you can cancel things off like this. So you cancel off, etc. This cancels, this cancels. And in the end, you just get f of one minus f of zero. Okay, so that shows we've got that expression. But now this is really cool. It's really cool because this is just going to equal to g of n minus one over n plus g of n minus two over n and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to match up. That term is going to be g of one over n plus g of zero. So adding up all these values of g and we're getting zero. So what does that tell us? 
Well, it tells us that all of them can't be positive because then their sum would be positive, and all of them can't be negative because their sum would be negative. So therefore, at least one has to be positive and at least one has to be negative. And now you might be getting the idea, therefore, g of i over n is going to be greater than zero, and g of j over n is going to be less than zero for some i and j. Okay, so for some i and j, one less than or equal to i j, less than or equal to n minus one. This is going to be true. So therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, so therefore g of x is equal to zero for some x in the interval. Okay, so for some x in inside zero one, inside the closed interval zero one, and that's by the intermediate value theorem. Since g is continuous, it's positive somewhere, negative somewhere, and of course that means that therefore f of x plus one over n is going to equal to f of x. Okay, so for that value of x. I have one challenge for you as well. Suppose instead of 1 over n, we replaced it with a number like 2 over 5 or a number like 2 over 3. Is it always true that the conclusion is satisfied? Or can you find a counterexample? Drop a comment down below. I'd love to see it. Okay, it's a challenge. I'm going to do a follow-up video on this one, and I'd love to hear your thoughts before I do that. Let me know down in the comments down below if you'd like to see a follow-up video as well. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. A huge thank you so much to Alex, Nathan, and Trang for their ongoing support on Patreon. Please consider supporting on Patreon if you're consistently gaining value from my content. It makes a world of difference. You can find a link down in the description and their exclusive perks. And my gratitude to you for your ongoing support, which really powers the channel forward. And I've got two fun videos for you. You're going to love these videos. The first one is a construction of an increasing function from the real numbers to itself that is discontinuous at every rational number and continuous at every irrational number. So it jumps up at every rational number. How cool is that? Check out that video here. You're going to love it. And another fun video is a proof, a companion to that one, that an increasing function from r to r actually has to be continuous almost everywhere. It can't be discontinuous on all of r. It's another super popular video on my channel. Have a great day, and I'm going to see you in the next video. Either of those two, let me know what you think.